Welcome to this given workshop. I'm Kevin Mormon, and I am a lecturer at the National University of Ireland in Galway. And um, I'm going to talk to you about the given uh, toolbox, which is a MATLAB toolbox. Gibbon loosely stands for Geometry and Image-Based Bioengineering Add-on, and I started the project in 2006, roughly, so it's been many years in the making, and it's now effectively a toolbox for computational biomechanics, or computational mechanics in general. It, um, here's an overview picture on the website. It offers CAD tools, for, for instance, for extrusion and lofting of features, which is really sort of a, a geometry processing toolkit, I suppose. And then surface meshing techniques, remeshing techniques, um, volumetric meshing, so tetrahedral elements or mixed uh, tets and hexahedral elements, spatially varying meshes, ladder structures, as well as uh, finite element analysis capability by coupling with FEBio or Abacus if you want. Um, visualization tools are also added that are usually not available in MATLAB, and as well as image segmentation to create your model, say based on medical images. Okay, so here we're looking at the website. The website contains installation instructions as well as documentation and uh, a list of people that are involved in the project, for instance. And the documentation here is searchable as well. Okay, so if you're interested in installing it, uh, basically you go to installation and either you set up Git and GitHub, which is recommended, or you download the zip uh, directly. If you set up Git, you're happy to do that. You can also have a closer look at the GitHub page where you see README with all the information as well. And um, I'm hoping more people will engage on GitHub because that's where you can post issues. Um, say here, someone says there's an error in a particular function that I have to address. So that's where your support uh, is found as well on GitHub. Okay, so back to maybe an overview of what uh, Given is. I already mentioned segmentation. Here on the website, you see a little demo of a lower limb uh, for transtibular amputee and we're segmenting, say, a particular bone. On the right, you see CT of an elephant's foot. And uh, you see here these lofting codes that work uh, that, say, create uh, CAD-style features. Here we go from a star shape to another, I don't know, peanut shape, and we're able to create a surface. Sorry, that's my phone buzzing, I'll turn that off. Um, and some surface processing, uh, meshing, and those lattice structures that you saw. And the FEBio interface is described here as well. These are typical FEBio demos, for instance, mammography, a blood clot traveling in a blood vessel, uh, sort of soft robotics, here's a propeller hitting something with contact, and twisting large deformations and sliding. All of these have been implemented as demos in Gibbon uh, that link with FEBio. Okay, so let's get started. I showed you where to, in principle, download the software from the website. Once you have it, it I suppose you have it in a particular folder. I have it in a Gibbon folder, uh, on my, in my MATLAB folder. Okay, and there you will find install given, which is just a script that allows you to install it. So you open that, then you have that open. You don't need to do anything else. You could uh, to uh, you don't have to edit it or anything. You either click this green run button or you hit F5, which is save and run. Okay, and then you can see this little install script starts. It adds functions to the paths for MATLAB, so all of the toolbox functions are known. Then you need to give the path to where FEBio is. So on this computer. I have FEBio Studio installed, and this is where it is. You have a binary folder, and there's FEBio 3. So this would be my path here, and I would copy that and paste it in here, or I use Browse here to, to find that path. So this is only if you want to add FEBio, you don't have to. So then I confirm that path, it unzips some data, integrates to help, and then it's actually all done. Uh, yeah, done integrating help. Now, it says use gdoc, that command, to open the given help information. Done. And I think it opens the given help information, and here it is, uh, the different uh, functions uh, can be found. And this is MATLAB's integrated help window now, okay? If you have trouble finding that, you can also go home, and then big question mark, yep. And then there should be supplemental software in the bottom here somewhere. There's supplemental software, and I click on given toolbox, and I can access all the help from within MATLAB too. But sometimes actually the website searched, uh, searchable documentation here is pretty handy too, because uh, it searches the function name if you're not exactly sure. Uh, we'll, we'll use that maybe later. Okay, so that's installation. Uh, so if I close that, let's uh, get started using it. Now, this is only roughly 45 minutes, this lecture or workshop that we're doing here today. I cannot give you an overview of nearly 15 or more years of work in code, right? It's very difficult to convey code uh, rather than a GUI where you say click here, click here, click here. In, in a workshop session, I would usually walk around and have people play with demos and it would be um, a multiple hour or multiple multiple multi multi day program. Um, so today I've only 45 minutes in a video, so it'll be very difficult maybe to to really do a thorough um, uh, display. 
I'm just going to increase the font in my editor a little bit for the purpose of this video. So uh, apply. Okay. So first thing, I'm just going to give an introduction into how to play around with meshes, how they are handled in MATLAB, for instance. I just did clear all close all CLC, which just, uh, if, I, if I hit that, you'll see there's no figures open, the workspace is empty, and the command window is cleaned as well. There's nothing there. So we're having a fresh start here. This is just some M file that I'm starting. So you can try to follow along as well. Here we'll have plot settings, and I'll do a marker size uh, 50, for instance. And we're going to do some stuff, and then we're going to do visualization. And here we're going to do something. Okay, let's create vertices, which is my word for nodes, because MATLAB uses that for nodes. Um, let's say 0, 0, 0 is a vertex. Okay. And in visualization, let's um, do figure and then plot. Well, usually you have to give the x, y, and z coordinate, which is annoying. So, or that's long at least. So I've created a plot v function in given, which allows you to just give it v straight away. And now I can say, let's say black dots, and we say marker size, marker size. Okay. And then we'll say draw now. And am I missing anything? No, that's good. And you can see if you stand on the variable in MATLAB, you can highlight where it's used, which is quite a handy feature. Okay, so, so far we're just, just going to be plotting one point. Fantastic. Next, let's add another point. One, zero, zero. One step in the x direction. Now we have two points, right? Great. Another point. One, one, zero. We should have three points. And that's right. Now this rotation, as you can see, when I rotate, it scales the axes. Um, it becomes smaller and bigger. It becomes square or rectangular. It, it is making a mess of it, basically. And if I try to rotate fully down, it gets stuck. I can't rotate it further down. Or fully up, I can't rotate it further up. So MATLAB's default rotations are annoying, I find. And also, the figures are default very small. And there's a gray background, which I don't like. But that could be personal. Let's close this. And instead of figure, use C figure, which could be seen as custom figure or given. If I run that, you'll see I have a maximized figure window. Um, and there's a different rotate uh, feature that allows me to rotate fully. Now, another thing you should do is axis geom, which uh, calls a given function that helps set all the axis properties that it's geometry, that each axis would be, say, scaled in millimeters or meters, whatever you like. So now um, we have this system, and you can see that it doesn't scale anymore. It's actually fully rotating. What I'm using to rotate is this button here, which is a view control widget. I can press either V to have it run, or I can click that button, and there you can control the view. Right click is zooming, left click is panning, so or like uh, moving it about, and the middle mouse button, if you, you, should, you really need a three button mouse for this, uh, allows you to rotate, and now it's similar to a CAD package in that you can keep rotating, nothing stops. Right? Uh, okay, maybe people are getting sick of that rotation, I'll stop. So that's three points defined there, right? And we have uh, V is the vertices, and if I ask for size V, it is a three by three, right? Um, we can add another point, which would be uh, 0, 1, 0. And now we have four points. Right. OK. So that's, that's vertices. So I could add a comment here, vertices. And let's do faces. So one face I can do is 1, 2, 3. So what's a face? Faces are basically indices into the nodal array. And by connecting those nodes, you build a face. So the, the usual command in MATLAB is very long and convoluted. Here you can just go uh, patch f, comma v. So now it's showing a patch, and that, oh, it's gone. And you get a bonus point if you know why it's gone, because hold on isn't on. This is the most stupid MATLAB feature ever, but they have it. If you plot two things after each other, that is a plotting line content, it deletes the previous thing. So if I say hold on, it's still there. There's a triangle now, connecting points one, two, and three together. Um, the color, default color is green, but I could give it a different color, like red, for instance, and now it's obviously red or RW, which is a color that I've implemented, sort of red-whitish. Uh, some of the W, RW, BW, it's kind of blue-whitish, are sometimes more pleasing to, to use than these very primary hard colors. OK, the next thing would be edge color. Uh, let's say I did that green, then you can see the effect there. The edges are green, a bit thin. So uh, uh, we'll work on that. The next one is transparency. I can make it half transparent. And the next one then is edge length. Uh, OK, so if I run that, you'll see figure edges and a transparent uh, triangle. OK, uh, let's do five. See what that's like. That's super chubby edges now. Great. And if you're wondering, where does he get all this from? Well, obviously, I know it. But you can uh, search gpatch here on the help on the website to get you some help information on that particular function. It shows you how to use it, how to control the colors of models and faces and meshes. And um, yeah, so that's that. Also, in MATLAB, you can say gdoc 
so give the documentation and then the name of the function gpatch and it'll open that in the uh, matlab integrated help which is exactly the same as the website also when there's help information available so if you see this file and you're happy or like you want to play with that you can actually do open help underscore and then the name of the function with capital letters so if i open that now i have that exact i run this this is the documentation file it does the exact same thing see so you can verify everything and, and start copy pasting from the documentation into your own codes okay but for now here it is g patch faces vertices some colors edge colors transparency and edge thickness so here you might say uh, edge thickness okay equals three and I might use that and in subsequent plots. And then if, I, if you switch to a different screen, you might want a different marker size. I find that at work, I have different settings for at home, for instance. All right, so there's a triangle. You can add another one. Um, I think that's one, two, three. Is it uh, three, two, four? Am I wrong? Nope, that's wrong. Is it um, three, one, four? There, okay. So now we have the three triangles, uh, sorry, two triangles for those four points. And you might wonder if the face order is correct. So there's patch normal so i'm using also a tab to auto complete a tab here to patch normal plot we want to plot the normal vectors ah look my second phase points the other way so they're not consistent with each other so instead of three one four i should use a four one three and in that order they are now consistent and they point in the, in the right way you see that could be important for contact so now we're exploring normal vector directions um, we can also add color information to these faces so that each face has its own little label. I can label the first one, sort of an index of the face, one, and the second one, two. And now instead of the red, uh, I could use C. And therefore now each face is its own little color, as you can see. And this is color map driven, so I can have color bar, but that's a default color bar in MATLAB. It is a smooth gradient. That's not too useful for these discrete sets of like one, two, etc. You want an integer color bar, so I color bar, is the given command to have an integer color bar. Now you can see blue is one, yellow is two, and it's easy to read that from the um, from the graph, okay? So maybe another one would be font size, font size 50. If I do that, I can say, um, for the current axis, use uh, font size. And now the font size is massive, that's too big. I'll go to 25 there, so maybe people can read that more easily. All right, so that shows you that now I have two triangles and they have different colors and we have normals aligned. So these colors are actually um, color labels. So they offer sort of a handle on parts of the model. Colors, color labels, uh, which are handy. Okay, so let's now um, make the mesh a bit more complicated. Um, first of all, actually, let me delete the color, go back to uh, maybe green, green, white. And instead of one, two, three, I have one, two, three, four. Now I have a single quad. Um, so the color bar is still there, but I wasn't using it here. So you can see one, two, three, four. Now, now we're plotting quads. So triangles and quads are supported in the uh, patch command. Actually, any type of face is supported. Okay, and now if we were to add another layer of points, but then we set the Z, we set the Z coordinate to one, I suppose we have a layer on top. And we could call that an element, and that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is a uh, hex element, right? And it has, so, yeah. So if I if I want to, to visualize that now, now I have lots of points, but I'm only creating that first face, you see? I'm gonna undo that color bar for the moment, and what else? I am going to, I, I really want all the faces. Well, I have a command for that. You could harvest that, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and all these other faces. Or you can use the element to patch command to turn your um, edges into a face description. And then you can see that now I have the full queue uh, available. Then if I say the colors are uh, uh, one in steps of one up to size uh, F comma one, and let me transpose that, then you get, whoops, I went, I'm not using it yet, the C, putting that C in as the color. And now um, I'm also gonna turn the edge colors back to black turn the color bar back on, and you'll see now I have six colors for the top, front, left, and sides of each direction. I have um, given it a color. Let me turn off transparency so you can see that a bit better. There, right? Um, so each face now has its own color, and that's handy because then you can pick out particular faces. We could say uh, logic top face, or faces, let's call it faces because it could be multiple, is where C 
equals equals something. What is the number that I need? If I double click this, I think it's the light blue. It's two in this case. So it's two. Let's uh, make, I just copy this plotting, make it half transparent and create a, uh, a new plot, which I'll plot just in red and non-transparent. And that'll only be these faces. Right. Index into F, use the logic. And now I'm plotting the top faces as red. That looks funny now. Maybe I'll make the other ones not color driven, but white. So that stands out more. There, you can see we have a hold on now the, the top faces. So what nodes are that? So this is just, uh, if you have the faces array, these are the faces. Then that logic top faces is just no, yes, no, 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 no. You can see then it's the second face that we're after. Um, how do we get indices for the top? Nodes. So we could say F, um, basically what I said here, those are the nodes now for the face, right? That defines the face. So these are the nodes. Sometimes these are the, it contains double nodes. I'm just going to get used to putting unique on that. I can say int top vertices equals unique of that thing. OK, great. Now I can plot those points as maybe I'll plot them as red. OK, oops, they're as red points and maybe twice the marker size that I had. You can see that I now have a handle on the top nodes. OK, so this shows you very quickly how you could use uh, indices and logic arrays to um, access and, and plot and visualize different parts of models, which you can use to define boundary conditions on, uh, on meshes and models. What we can do, I'll, I'll go through the codes and um, you can take, in your own time, you can have a closer look at these yourself. So it, it is now going to be quite a fast overview of the different capabilities of Gibbon. And I'll stop here and there to show you something but it's largely quite fast. I, I don't have much of another choice uh, for today. I apologize for that. But do follow up with questions if you have them. So I said Gibbon can do processing of uh, geometry. Well, it starts with curves. So fillet curve is a command that you can see here. And I'm running all the help files. You can see here I have a stack of stuff ready to show you today. And uh, But you can open these as well. So all of these fillet curve is a function. Well, then open uh, help underscore fillet. You can start typing something. Do tab for all the completes, and it'll do that. And you can open that. Okay. What does fillet curve do? Well, um, if oops, if I have a particular curve, for instance, this guy, these dashed lines, the black and the black dots, I could create the red line using this function, which basically fillets it. Right? It creates a particular radius uh, between the different um, angles, and that might be nice to define some kind of part or um, an implant or something like that. Then there's Bezier curves. They're very handy. Um, so I implemented Bezier curves. It, they match, uh, here the, the black dots are the control points if you're not familiar, and the red curve is the Bezier curve. They have really well-defined start and end derivatives, which are very handy for creating uh, control curves. Um, for instance, for lofting or sweeping paths, or for, for creating other kinds of features. So that's the Bezier curve. Um, then once you have curves, you might extrude them or evenly sample them. So let's get to the evenly sample curve function. Okay, it shows you lots of stuff. I'll let it finish. Okay. Um, here you have a normal sine curve, but you can see at the where it's roughly flat in the x direction, the spacing is different from um, uh, in other places where there's lots of action in the y direction, right? So uh, the sine function here is unevenly spaced. So with the evenly sample curve function, we can evenly sample, and this can also be done with closed curves. So here you see a nice example of a very randomly sampled funny flower shape. Well, we can pass it through our functionality and sample that evenly. The sampling can be done also in a smoothing sense. So this is uh, a noisy, crazy shape. And here we have smoothened it and sampled it evenly. You can do that too. Uh, other than that, there we can handle closed curves. So this, this, let's say this is a square and you give it four points. Usually interpolation doesn't know that endpoints are connected. I've graded it such that it can handle closed curves if you tell it it's closed. Okay, so that's the evenly sample curve function. Once you have a curve, you might want to extrude it. Poly extrude is a function that can take any curve and extrude it into a surface. Okay, I'll have a finish. So um, here you can see that it creates triangles. Uh, the curve can be arbitrarily in 3D, and here it extruded in two directions, but it could do just one or another uh, direction. Uh, there are different examples. You could see that we can create quadrilateral output faces or nearly equilateral triangles or these slashed triangles as well. So that's the poly extrude capability. Poly loft linear is the next step up in complexity. We go now from one shape to another. And you can go, say, from this red circle to this star shape. 
and it'll blend together that um, shape. That could be, say, an ellipsoidal section, an under section, or uh, the neck of a femur going to another part of the femur, or like you could build some kind of implant, and I'll show you later its use as well. Okay, sweep loft is a function that, well, does what it says on the can. It sweeps something along a curve, and it can also change shape of the section uh, in the meantime. So we can go from this peanut to the other peanut, the, the blue, sorry, the red to the green. In this case, I added extra twist. Here we go in a circular arc. There we go. Um, now, I'm not going to go into detail what it's visualizing, but uh, effectively, we have to figure out what rotations to use uh, to get from the start to the end. This is an example of a closed curve and um, with twist in it as well. There. And here it's a nice um, sort of, I call this a Gabor, Gabor coil. Uh, we pull a circle along it to create sort of this nice um, uh, coil-like tube. And um, the final result then gives you a surface, either of triangles or quads. And that's quite pleasing. There are cases where that goes wrong, where the curvature is too high and the shape bites itself. In the polytube command, which currently only works for, for circles uh, sort of pulled along a curve, I've implemented a fix for that. So this curvature is too high, and then the shape, you know, wraps in on itself, so it bites itself. And I've implemented a fix for that. So you can see here that that's fixed. So the polytube command has that fix in it. Okay, then there's triangle meshing of a curve. So you might have one or more curves denoting a region. The blue curves here are those regions. So here there's a star shape and another star containing inner things. So let's Conceptually, you could say there's a skin surface, and then there's a muscle fat boundary, a muscle layer, maybe some other tissue, intramuscular tissue, and then hollow bones or something. So th this can be meshed continuously, and each of these regions can have its own point spacing as well. So this is the multi-region tri-mesh function. There's a similar function that can handle 3D curves, and so not just 2D in the plane. Here, there's a star with holes in it, but it, um, it meshes that in 3D as well. Okay, now we're at sub-tri. Subtriangulation. So you might want to refine your structure. So um, here it is refining a single triangle. Each triangle, after one refinement step, becomes four. And this is just subdividing in a linear sense. What do I mean by that? that if you had, say, this coarse uh, spherical shape, that after refinement, it is still it still has the same shape exactly, just more triangles. You might want, excuse me, you might want it refined and smoothened at the same time. But not really smoothened. It fits a higher order spline. Subtri loop uses the loop subdivision algorithm, and um, you'll see here. So let me just let this finish. Sorry, the demo is longer. So you could see that for an icosahedron, which is an even even coarser spherical triangulation, it converges during refinement on sort of a spherical shape, as you can see. So while you refine, you also smooth them, and that can be really nice. Um, here's also an example of uh, surface color handling. That could be a result that you want to maintain, um, or a physical thing that you want to maintain during subdivision. But here you can see that the subdivision does a really good job at uh, creating a smoother spline-like representation of the object during uh, subdivision. Okay. Um, and we have the same, do you have that open? Yes, I should use that now. We have a similar thing for, it's called Cottmull-Clark subdivision of quads. You can do linear quad subdivision, but here it is again some sort of spline fit. Uh, okay, so for a sphere then it would sort of converge, uh, sorry, for a cube it would converge on a spherical-like object, um, but actually for general meshes like this hump uh, surface with mountains in it, you can see it does a really nice job at sub subdividing it in a smooth sense, which is very useful. Okay, so that's for refinement of surfaces that are triangulated or quadrangulated. Um, then there is lattice functionality that I mentioned. So this function will take a moment to run, or this demo, uh, and then I'll get into the details. So what you see here is that we have an element description, for instance, a hexahedral element or a tetrahedral element, and then we build lattices from this. This final example here shows the Stanford bunny, but now we have created a tetrahedral lattice on the inside, and uh, it's fully surface conforming, but this lattice has uh, thin features on the left, and they get increasingly thick. So we can handle spatially varying lattice uh, structures. So how does this work? Well, for each of these, we start, this is your input element on the top left. Let's say it's a single hex element. Then we can pick a lattice that is composed of the edges, or a lattice that is instead composed of the interior, which is um, goes from the center of the element to the center of the faces. And the two, this can be, if you do multiple elements, so this is a single element, uh, it's multiple elements. Here, for instance, there's 
uh, an input structure that has uh, more elements, okay? And you could take these and convert them to tets, and then you get this type of structure. And that, that this is the, the edge lattice, and this is the interior lattice. And these can be smoothed too with those methods that I just uh, described, this cutmore clark subdivision. Let's have a look at the diamond lattice, which is a different function, the diamond lattice. Actually, this function is great because it exports elements, finite elements, straight away. So it exports tetrahedral elements and pentahedral elements. So you can create a lot of structure and straight away export it for finite element analysis. And here, with uh, loop subdivision, I'm creating a smooth lattice that is nicely rounded um, that you can use for 3D printing. I'm holding the 3D print of this object up to the camera right now. So you can see that you can export SDL files for all of the structures for mechanical testing, uh, for instance, if you want. All right. Um, what is next? Uh, dual lattices are handy too. Well, this is any any uh, lattice can be turned into a dual lattice, and this is something that I'm adding at the moment, a feature for sort of uh, modeling uh, bone structures like trabecular bone. Okay. Um, speaking of those types of structures, there's strictly periodic minimal structures, and uh, they are mathematical functions that offer surfaces with interesting curvatures, and you can study those in your own time. Um, this last surface. I've also printed, I'm holding that up to the camera there. So you could thicken these and then use them for 3D printing um, or for fine balance analysis. They're also kind of trabecular bone-like structures sometimes. Um, now this function will take a while to run. Recently we implemented spinodoid and stochastic microstructures that also mimic bone in some sense. Um, this will take a while to run. But it'll create a quasi-random stochastic structure and the nice thing is, hopefully you recognize that I used, I think I used a different color map previously, but the boundary faces have been given different colors. So now we have a handle on them. So we can pick the top surface, bottom, or prescribing boundary conditions on in, in your codes as well. The blue surface is the full interior. Um, okay, that's that. And there's lots of sort of boxes and cubes and spheres. So codes for, for generating uh, surfaces that are handy to use. For instance, for spherical indentation or something like that. And these are beautiful geodesic triangulations um, that um, offer really nice uh, triangle quality. I also implemented curvature analysis. This might be nice if you want to locally refine at a highly curved area. This is uh, the David test model, and you can see there's, um, let's look at the nose, there's curvature in one direction. These are the principal curvature directions. And then in the other direction of the nose, it's highly curved. Um, and these two directions, uh, yeah, you might want to study that. So this is curvature. Okay. Batch curvature. You can import SDL files. Uh, new the latest MATLAB has a, has a native function for that already, but Gibbon has a function for it too. So here's an imported SDL file from, um, uh, well, imported geometry from an SDL file within Gibbon. Um, then batch feature detect. So when you import something and it doesn't have face labels like I mentioned before, we can actually detect those. So this is our imported feature or like object. And then you can see it has fat faces and teeth and all sorts of things. Uh, based on angles, patch feature detect will give you color handles, color labels for each of these. It's kind of like in a finite element package that each surface feature could be numbered or something. You have surface one, surface two, etc. available. Now you could easily define boundary conditions on the inner hole, for instance, if you wanted using these color handles. Um, then there's GG remesh, which is a very handy remeshing functionality. So I, I'm going to let this run and then go back to the themer because that's a really nice example. But effectively, it's able to create very high quality triangulations on arbitrary surfaces. You can handle open open surfaces too, and you can ask it to close it over or keep it open. Here we kept the cylinder open uh, during remeshing, but you can also ask it to cure holes and here it's closed. Um, yeah, so it can downsample from a fine to, to coarser, which is also shown for this uh, bunny rabbit. But um, this is something that I wanted to show you. If you look at this femur, uh, we can zoom in on some terrible triangulated elements that are very steep, uh, poor quality triangles. But now let's look at the same region in this remeshed example and you can see that's a very nice quali high quality uh, nearly homogeneous triangulation. Okay so that's a very useful function. GG remesh. Okay. Um, you might want to chop surfaces so you might import a bone and then cut it and then do something with it. So the tri-surf slice, that, yeah, tri slice function offers a way to split the surface in half so that it accommodates the sliced curve but then you can obviously not keep the top or the bottom, uh, if you, or just keep the bottom, for instance, and then you have this uh, cut surface. Okay, it may need remeshing because the cut does create some sharp uh, triangles. I can show you uh, what I mean by that. 
if you cut, if I do this slowly, you'll see what you'll see what happens. As we cut, this is a cube now. Um, you, here's the original triangles, but as I move to cut down, uh, it's going to have to slice it along that direction and introduce new triangles that are sharper. But with post-processing, you can fix that. In in essence, it's valid geometry that comes out of a slice operation. So that's slicing surfaces. You can also extend them. So it's the opposite of slicing, adding it. So here I have a funny okay. Um, there's different methods for extending, but let me just focus on the, the principle itself. You take a surface, it's a funny gray surface that we have here, and the blue stuff is extended. We use the blue vectors, which are the edge direction vectors, to extend it a little bit. Uh, you might want that too. Okay. Then it's very handy to convert um, patches or any meshes into images. Straight away, that gives you a voxel-based hexahedral mesh. And if, there's mul if you give it multiple surfaces, like here in this case, a donut with a ball and a ball within a ball, each of these regions will have its own little label. So the, you have a handle now on the element material regions, if you will. Um, and also we have, uh, if you uh, want it, we have these gray voxels, which are boundary voxels. So we're not quite sure if they're out or in, but they're uh, on the boundary of the surfaces. Um, then it's very important in geometry processing sometimes to, to do smoothing. And many packages do this. If you do this in Mimix or a commercial package, you might click smooth, 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 but you're not quite sure what's happening. On the left is Laplacian smoothing, on the right is Humphrey's classes, or a very noisy bunny. Let's have a look at what's happening. Um, and let's animate that. On the right, you can see Humphrey's classes avoids shrinkage. Now, this is an excessive distortion of the bunny rabbit, right? This is very noisy. But you can see after some iterations of Laplacian smoothing, you got it. But if you go on too long, um, it departs from it a lot, whereas the Humphrey's classes smoothing um, takes it slow and ensures that it doesn't um, uh, depart from your original shape too much. Okay, so you might want to study, uh, study that. Um, what you saw me use just now is the Anim8 functionality, and that allows you to animate anything that you can have plot handles or graphics handles for in MATLAB. Here's a little demo that I could do that is interesting of a Lego figure um, that is uh, walking around. You could uh, change the timing of it and uh, just have them walk around and export this as a GIF as well say for social media or sharing in, um, in um, with publications or in presentations. Okay, so these buttons and this uh, slider bar are very handy with the animate function. Um, then TetGen offers tetrahedral meshing. So we give it a surface and we ask it to fill it with tets and it does a good job there. You can open all these demos and study them in your own time. Uh, here's it doing its work for a femur. You might have two regions contained in each other, so two material regions. They can have different point spacings and mesh densities associated with them. Uh, so that's this demo. There's quite a lot of things happening in this code. Here's a bunny rabbit with two bunny rabbits in it, and you can see a very fine mesh on the right there for one of them. Uh, here's a dinosaur with an egg in it, <laughs> with a void in it, so voids can be handled. Here's a bar that is meshed, and we have a function that says, hey, on the left I want it finer than on the right, so there's a spatially varying density that's happening there. Um, I think what's next? Oh, complicated topology. I might click on that shortly, just let it finish first. Okay, and the last one is TET 10 elements. So 10 noded um, nonlinear TETs are supported as well. You can see nodes at the center of the edges here. So that's supported too. And you close this and say, what I meant by that complex topology, the, the red shell has a blue layer on the inside, but that has a hole passing through both into a central hole. So uh, using appropriate coding, we can automate the meshing of such complicated topologies as well. Okay, now how do you get a surface then, right? So you can import it as an SCL, but you might want to segment it. The IMX function allows you to segment it. Um, so once you have an image, you could run IMX. So uh, you would run like, uh, if the image is M, you do IMX M, and you could run your segmentation. In this demo, it uploads some MRI data, calls it M for instance, and here I also give it the voxel size and the path to use for saving when I'm uh, doing my segmentation. Let's run this demo or, or help file. You can see we have some uh, CAF data. The view control widget is straightway loaded, so I can move this around. This is a MRI data of a human CAF. Um, and this is the tibia and that's the fibula. And now using the little um, pen symbol, I can draw my contour. Using the sample contour button, I can select it or try to make a contour. You could see this is quite good, but now it departs from the bone. This black surface is wrong. So I click where it went wrong, and there this is now quite a good sketched or dashed line. If I want to accept it and keep it for the slice, I click accept or this little finger uh, or hand symbol. Uh, there it is accepted. 
And now I could iron it out, so iron out the bumps, so smoothen it. Either pressing Q or this button with the iron, I can make it smoother, smoother, smoother. And there you go. There's a smooth contour for this slice. Then I could use either of these um, bars to scroll through the slice, or I can press space to go to the next slice. Now, once you get the hang of it, you can go S, select A, accept Q, smooth, next slice. S for select, whoops, S select, there, got it. A for accept, Q for smooth. And you can click that a couple of times until you're happy with it. Space for next. S for select, and that's how you would process this. This could be 100 slices, so it would take you like, I don't know, 20 minutes to, to pass through the whole uh, structure or something like that. So if you're interested in how we're doing, um, you might want to see the contours for all slices. Let me do one more. Uh, okay, so there's the parted. This works by just fitting contours at a particular ISO level wherever I click. So let's have a look. That's my current contour. Where's the other ones gone? There they are. Are they fitting in 3D? Yeah, that looks pretty good to, to capture the bone, right? How about here? Well, I have to position this slice a bit better. Oh, that looks great. It's, um, it's actually capturing it pretty well. You could, you could zoom in a bit more. So you have to get used to the, the, the mouse handling a bit, but that's like with any software package, right? That you have to get used to it. I'm pretty happy with those contours there. Okay, if you did that to the whole bone, um, which would take a while, then um, uh, you're ready for the next step. Let me do one and let me pretend it's difficult. So sometimes it's difficult. Here, let's say I couldn't, if I click here, that's a good one, right? So now I could accept this one. But let's go back to that bad one. Let's say I wanted to cut that away. So, and it's also departing from here. So I like this part, but the other side is bad. Then maybe I'll select, you see this one. I'd say, okay, I got that off and this off. So usually it groups it now. You can see there's red and orange. I'm not gonna keep the orange. I'm gonna also get the red and I want to merge it. So I accept it, merge it with that one. And now they're together and uh, open bits will actually be, if, there, if it's, if the straight connection of the open part is suitable, then just let that happen. With uh, it'll it'll be okay. So if I smoothen it now with Q, you can see that was sort of a slightly trickier step where I had to use cutting and grouping to get it done, but it does work. Also, there's growing of contours, shrinking of contours, moving, uh, all sorts of functions that you can check out uh, in your own time. So what's next then? Once you have those contours, those lines, you can use contour to level set the next function to translate those contours into a surface model. Sorry, first step is the level set. Level set is an image, it's kind of like a heat map. Blue is cold and that's on the inside. Red is hot and that's on the outside. That's, let's call it that, right? But white is spot on on my surface. So these are all of the contours that you would have gotten if you continued that step of segmentation. And again, blue is on the inside, red is on the outside. Now all that is left to get a surface model is to just draw an isosurface at the level zero. So that's the next step. This code will actually briefly recreate the level set function but uh, give it a moment. It converts the level set then to an ISIS surface. And I think we're remeshing the GG remesh as well. So the result will be, let's see, there it's on the MRI. On the left here is my bone surface now. And you can see these are lovely triangles. Usually the ISIS surface command produces a terrible triangulation, but now we have quite a good triangulation. You can compare that to your original contours and see how far off they are. And they're actually pretty good. You might be worried if we're still on top of the image. I'll then plot it on top of the image and have a look. You can see the blue surface does a good job of capturing everything, so I'm happy there. You can do that then to all of your bones separately and all of your skin and muscle fat boundaries separately and uh, build your model in meshes that way. You might have to cut them at certain levels and fill the triangulated regions that you've cut back in with region tri-mesh and something like that. But uh, that's how you build your models. Next, then you're ready to work with FEBio, right? Let me go to the, the website. There's an image here that I wanted to show you that conveys how to code. Oops, uh, open message, open image in new tab. Yeah, so FEBio features an XML format. I think this is the uh, user manual for FEBio. So if I go to uncoupled solid materials, Ogden, you can see here they describe typically the Ogden formulation and the parameters, but also how to code it in XML in the FEBio input file. So then here is something like that, but for a new Hookian model, you can see E Young's modulus, new Poisson ratio, and we see capital letters material, small letters material, ID1, this is the first material, or a material labeled with the ID1. The type for this material, that attribute, is called Neo Hookian. So, how would you code all this? You can see we have sort of sub layers and we have sort of, sort of a child of, child of sort of indentation in sort of this nested structure. 
But we also see attributes like ID and type, which aren't the same as parameters like E and V. So the way I solve that is that I use the ATDR thing that you see here to say that's an attribute, okay? First off, the whole file or the whole FEBIOS structure is stored in a structure in MATLAB. That's called FEBIOS spec. Dot means we're going one level in, in the XML. So dot material, dot small letter material. And then we have an index one. So if you have multiple materials, you use an index here. Dot attribute dot type equals new hookin. Dot attribute dot ID equals one. And if you skip the ATTR, uh, the attribute flag, it will assume it's a parameter. So E here is one and new or V equals 0.45, that's what it will code it as. I'm not gonna to talk too much about Abacus, but you can do the same for Abacus. Once you know the input structure very well, instead of um, uh, the, the nested structure in XML, it becomes star something. So dot attribute dot name, elastic becomes star elastic, head uh, like sort of nested under material, if you will. And if you list some parameters, they're just listed like that. So if you know how to build your input structure, input file structure, you know how to code it using this sort of uh, mental map. Uh, that I've, I've presented there. And there's a help function here for both the Abacus version and the FEBIO version. Uh, here, you could see, for instance, how that uh, Ogden material could be coded um, that you saw in the um, um, user manual for FEBIO. Uh, by the way, you can uh, call FEBIO from within MATLAB by just saying FEBIO, and it'll start FEBIO and do something. Uh, you can go FEBIO, oops, FEBIO, FEBIO, I wonder if this works now. Yeah, FEBIO documentation. Okay, this used to work that it opens the documentation here, but the PDF is now too big for MATLAB to handle. So I'll, I'll try to fix that in the future. Anyway, uh, what's next? Demos, there's a ton of demos for FEBIO implemented in Gibbon. Okay, so um, demo underscore lets you, lets you find those demos. Let me first uh, show you some advanced demos. Aorta build, demo Aorta build. If I run this, it'll create a code that features sweeping, as you can see, to create the Aorta branch. Now it creates a split in it. Now it creates uh, circles where side branches should appear. Each of these are uh, sweep lofts. Um, there's the side branches. Sorry, lots of stuff is happening. Uh, but I think you appreciate that this is an automated way to create a patient-specific model. And it, use, it could run for a database of uh, segmented structures. These are spatially varying uh, material parameters now. I was saying that if you had 100 patients to do, this will automate the process of creating all the final element models. Okay, so once you've captured the process for one, it could hold for all of them. Okay, then uh, demo underscore, what else do we have that is interesting? Um, well, the cube uniactual is a great one to start for FEBIO. So that's 001. So the FEBIO demos are named demo underscore FEBIO. And if I run this now, we will see that uh, it creates a cube. It has face labels that allows us to get node sets. Sorry, it's done already. I can't speak fast enough. So let me close these curves. What it did is this, uh, uniaxial compression of a cube. And you can open such models, if I refresh it, um, in FEBIO Studio as well. So we just ran this model in MATLAB, but it works in FEBIO Studio as well. So you can view the results there. But actually, with Animate and uh, functionalities, visualization tools in MATLAB, you can do view nearly everything you want in MATLAB as well. It'll be sometimes less efficient for very large models, but still it does the, does the job. And if I open that code, so that demo is available, I can open it. And if I very briefly, so it's way too much to treat in one day, right? But in essence, look, plot settings, font size, marker size, I used that before. Control parameters, we have cube size, sample width. Where does that go? It goes into cube dimensions, which goes into hex mesh box, which creates a mesh from which we get E, the elements, V, the vertices, FB, the boundary faces. And I visualize that here. What are these boundary faces? Oh, like a cube with different colors, six different colors. So you now have sort of a, a handle on the different faces. And then that allows me to say, look, I want to support these blue guys in the Z direction, the, the black ones I want to pull at or push at, etc. cetera. So uh, let me see. So here I said, logic for a particular face is where the color equals one, and that'll be my support list in the X direction. Then if I scroll down, I can find that, where's that? oh, here. I create febio.mesh, node set, and then here's my node set, okay? So this is too much and too complicated to handle in a single day or in a single hour, but you could see, maybe you appreciate how models are coded uh, in uh, MATLAB for febio. Okay, so let's uh, run some more demos. Demo febio, what else is there? Uh, force at the end of a beam. So we have beam, 
These are nonlinear hex elements, so they have extra nodes in the middle of the edges, and we're just putting a force at the end of it. It ran every bio, and here's the, uh, here's the result. Okay, so maybe you believe uh, that simple models work. Let's go up the ladder of complexity. Uh, indentation, so we're building a sphere, we're defining contact. Uh, everything works with labels in the sense that, like how I was explaining it earlier, uh, with color labels. It's, you can view the process here, uh, of the, or the progress of your FBI simulation. Now it's done, importing the results and uh, visualizing everything. Okay, what else? More complicated, right? So demo, uh, underscore FE bio, and so what do we have? Trabecular compression. So this is using that, um, it's creating an isosurface, remeshing it, and assigning boundary conditions to it. Uh, that's meshed with Tetya now. Um, and it's gonna run FE bio. Uh, I'm not sure if it's fast enough for today. I might, oh, I'll, I'll let it finish. Then I'll jump to a more complicated example, and I think that I'm running out of time. So uh, then let this finish. It should import the results and show the compression of, of this structure. And we just built this structure, right? So it built the model and ran it in the time that I was talking to you. So that shows you how powerful this is. And I could change the point spacing in the code or run it in a loop for my convergence analysis to have it say increasingly finer. Um, FE bio 004, I think this is inverse FEA. What does that do? Well, you have, you have say some material testing that you did and you have an experimental curve, which is the black curve. And now we're running FE bio iteratively to, um, to get the best material properties. So if I close these other guys here, you could see uh, from the command window that I'm running FE bio iteratively lots of times. You can see my CPU being nice and busy with that. And the optimization in my lab is trying to figure out the correct material parameters to use. So I have an inverse final element analysis demo as well. And that shows you the power of coded modeling. Okay, so I, I'm going to interrupt this because we don't have time to wait for it. Um, then what else? So you can do full subject specific things. Here's a breast with a tumor inside and I'm going to define plates that were used in a mammography experiment. And let's say you know the force from the mammography and you're interested to see what stresses and strains were subjected or uh, created in the uh, soft tissue. As it's running, you could uh, have a look at uh, post, not post view, it's called FBI Studio now, right? And uh, see how the model is doing by refreshing it. So this is now FBI Studio, right? You can see that we're slowly squashing that rest and we're at 0.4 here. So I could refresh and have another look at it. Okay, so that'll slowly start compressing it. I think it'll take another minute to finish. But I think you, you get the point. I can, I can quit that now. Okay, uh, one more where we're doing design of something, okay? Um, let me see. Active contraction, foot insole, okay? So we take a foot, there we go, chop it, close it over, fill it with tetrahedral elements. The bones are a rigid void now. Uh, make it soft, as a soft tissue. Create a sole structure, thicken it, and assign spatially varying material parameters according to bone distance. So you might want uh, to avoid loading in vulnerable subjects, for instance. And now it's running so it just designed a shoe insole for us in the code, and now it's running the model to evaluate that shoe and the pressures for that shoe insole. Again, um, I think, is it getting there? I think it's a bit, a bit slow. But it just shows you the power of coded modeling, right? I'm, I'm again going to, to interrupt it because we don't have time for it. Okay, I think FBI is still busy, so. Okay, finished, great. So, but this shows you the, um, loading input as you step and load the, the sole. Right, let's move on to now this demo that shows you the creation of a hip implant from scratch. Take a femur, chop it, create an implant head, create an implant neck shaft, and the whole feature down the bone, uh, excavate that from the femur, create um, different materials for the implant, the tubercular bone and the cortical bone, then uh, define boundary conditions. That's on the head, distributed forces, distributed muscle forces on the bone, support in the lower end. These are all node sets. Um, and then run the model. So it's, it's running it now. So if we go here, it, they all have the same name when I run them from the bio, they're just called temp model. So you could view them all, delete the playing card. You could see now I have my nice um, uh, model here. Does this work? Yeah. Whoops. It's slower and faster than I thought. Um, Okay, so uh, it's running that now. It's nearly finished already. 
it's going to take a while to, to plot it, but I do want to, wanted to show you that. So just imagine the power of this now, right? We're using code to create an implant for a patient, a fully patient-specific implant, and it's evaluating it for that subject, um, all in the time that we're just looking at it. And I could replace the, the input data and it'll also still work. And that's the power of code's uh, mother. So I'll wait for this to import the results and uh, let it finish. So I'm hoping that people will um, start using FEBio together with Gibbon for the computational biomechanics studies. But here you see the, uh, the, the model finished evaluating uh, that particular impact. Okay, so I'm hoping that I've given you a nice introduction into the capabilities of Gibbon, spoke about each of these aspects, and you can try and open these demos yourself. You saw me work and, and run them. Hopefully you can uh, run them in the same way and explore the different, different concepts. And if there's any issues, you can point them, or you can post them uh, as an issue on the GitHub site and I'll try to get to it. But more than that, I hope that you will try to fix things yourself a little bit too and join as one of the contributors. So I'm here on the top left, but I welcome anybody to join the team, even if you contribute a very tiny, minor thing. Uh, I want you to be a member of it and get recognition for it. And maybe when there's a the next given paper, you'll be a co-author if you contribute sufficient code. So I, I really encourage people to join via GitHub and start collaborating on this, uh, what hopefully will become a big international project. Okay, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And um, yeah, uh, I look forward to answering questions. Thanks a lot for this opportunity for the workshop.